welcome to episode nine of my POA podcast, Black Hand and Beyond. I am Kent Rourke. We're broadcasting live from Studio J in Enid, Oklahoma. Uh, we come to you almost every Tuesday night around this time to talk about uh, POA history and sometimes modern POA things, uh, just basically everything POA to help keep the POA movement alive. So tonight our episode is going to be about Driftwoods POAs, which was Ray and Avis Peets from Spencer, Iowa, and then later their daughter, uh, Renee Toff, raised some POAs. Uh, but mainly tonight, we'll be focusing about Ray. Ray was a national board of director for a while in POAs, and uh, he raised hundreds of ponies over the years. Uh, he attended the international sale 40 some times, 40 years. Uh, so that's a, you know quite an accomplishment right there. Uh, he probably consigned uh, I would guess in the top five of everyone that ever consigned POAs, he's probably in the top five of consigners. So you have Lynn Puffenbarger and a few other people that consigned a lot, uh, but Ray Peets consigned many every year for, like we say, for decades after decades. So uh, we have some pictures tonight. It's going to be a fairly uh, quick show tonight. We're not going to do a thesis on uh, the Driftwoods. We're just going to kind of do, uh, you know, some photos, probably 50 some photos. So uh, we do have a few sponsors tonight. Don't forget the Sunflower Showdown in uh, Lyons, Kansas. That's going to be June 11th through the 13th, the B&P on the 11th, and then the Mid-America Regional will be on the 12th and the 13th. So they're going to have some cool things there. The Friday night at the pool, Saturday night exhibitor dinner, Sunday morning donut breakfast sponsored by the Texas POAC. They're going to have a lot of great awards, so uh, try to head to Lyons, Kansas in the early part of June for the great Mid-America Regional. And then don't forget the West World and the Rocky Mountain Regional, two great shows. They're going to be together this year in Lamar, Colorado, uh, the 4th of July weekend, July 1st through the 4th. Colorado always puts on uh, great big shows. They've had many worlds and West Worlds and Rocky Mountain Regionals in that state. Beautiful state to attend a show. Uh, great people out there, so that'll be uh, in Lamar, Colorado, uh, first part of July. And uh, if you're headed from the west, it'd be a great show to pick up some points on your way to uh, the Congress, which will be in Tulsa the next week. So uh, make plans now to attend the West World and Rocky Mountain Regional. So there is a picture of Ray, and we're going to I'm gonna put the camera back on me for a while, but we're going to talk about Ray now. Uh, the Driftwood POAs and some of the POAs he raised, like a lot of people, don't have his prefix. He, uh, for a few years, he went without a prefix, and he sold mares, and some people came, especially when he started getting older in the 90s. People started coming, getting some of his foals and yearlings, and they weren't registered yet, so they were putting their own names on them. Uh, but the POAs he has raised have won 100 classes at the International and Congress show. So... And uh, it's quite a few. I don't have a list of every one, but uh, like some breeders, like we talked about Suncrest last week or two weeks ago and how, you know, she had about four POAs that won a whole bunch of classes, like 20 some apiece, and she has 140 some wins. Well, Ray didn't have a lot of standouts that won, you know, 30, 40 classes, one horse. He just had a lot of horses, uh, a lot of POAs that won well. And uh, one of the things, now don't take this the wrong way, but his POAs over the years, I would say, you know, they kind of became class fillers too. You'd go to a show and there'd be six in a class, like nine through 12, or and this is back in the day now, eight and under, maybe third or fourth place during the weekend, you'd hear Driftwoods called out and uh, not always the champion, but they were horses, that, ponies that were good for kids to learn on and just ride. And, you know, like I say, he had 100 wins, so his horses won 100 classes. So he did have his share of champions, too. Uh, but the Driftwoods just seemed like they were a stepping stone a lot of times for kids in the in the little divisions in the thir 9 through 12 to work their way up maybe to a bigger supreme champion. So uh, Ray first attended the second international show, a buddy of his, uh, asked him if he wanted to go to the, the sale. I mean, not the show. In 1958, the international show st sale started in 1957 in uh, Mason City, Iowa. And in 1958, Ray and his friend drove over from Spencer, which isn't that far over, to, uh, to go to Mason City. And Ray actually purchased some POAs at his the second sale ever. 
And uh, he ended up going back in 59, and he bought some mares in 59. I believe he bought four mares. And uh, he actually bought some stallions, too. He bought Colimo or Colimo, however you say it, Jagged Blaze. They raised a lot of POAs, the Colimos. And uh, Red Duke were two stallions that he purchased. And then he also bought the four mares. And uh, three of them ended up not being uh, in full, but one was in full. And in 1960, she foaled War Chant in Spencer, Iowa at Ray's Place, and, uh, which became Driftwood Acres. And uh, he named him, like I said, War Chant. He was number 1,172. So 1,172 registered POA ever was born on Ray Pizza's Place. And uh, I think he was loud colored. I don't have a picture of him tonight, uh, but that kind of set the tone for Ray to, uh, he kind of got hooked like a lot of us did. He got the bug and uh, he started collecting mares. And there's years, I think, when Ray probably had 100 head of mares. So he had a lot of mares over the years. And one thing we're going to be talking about tonight is the revolving door he kept on his stallion barn. He, uh, I, I've written about this before, uh, stallions didn't get old in Spencer, Iowa. He, uh, he got rid of stallions. And uh, he didn't never believed in keeping a stay in a long time. He, now, there's been a few that he had quite a while. Uh, Lannan Series Super Spot, he purchased as a yearling. We'll be talking about him later. He kept him, but even him he got rid of when he was older and moved on to the next generation. He believed in a core mare band, and he kept mares for a long time. He'd get 10, 15 foals out of a mare, and he kept a lot of his fillies. Like a lot of great breeders, he believed that the next generation should be better. So if your breeding program works and you're a believer in it, you should keep some of your fillies. So he did that over the years, and you'll see some of these pedigrees have driftwoods uh, all down through the line. So here's a cool picture here. I actually have this in here a couple times. So I know some people watching tonight is going to recognize these two young guys here with uh, Ray. That's Ray at a sale, 1966, I believe. It's a Shirley Rice photo. She was popular at the time, a, a great horse photographer. This is Driftwood's Black Velvet, and that's Chris and Kevin Jewell, who's there. Uh, their dad, Aaron Jewell, bought him. He was still a colt in this picture, and Kevin just went on the history page the other day and said how they gilded him right after they got home uh, to, I believe, Green, Iowa. But they live in Iowa also, or they grew up in Iowa, the Jewell boys. So... Uh, this was an early day POA. This was in the 60s. Now, Ray's written himself in uh, breeder spotlights and stuff in the POA magazine that he uh, really believed in color. When he first got in POAs, he, he didn't know about confirmation that much, but he knew about color, and he liked to produce loud colors. And then he was in it for a while when he figured out, hey, you need confirmation too. And uh, so he started putting the confirmation, boy, did he ever. He went after halter horses for a long time in the 70s, but he had the color there due to some of the bloodlines he had. So uh, throughout the 60s, you know, he was building up his herd. And then uh, in 1967, that was a pretty big year for uh, Ray. He attended the sale again, and he purchased the Yearling Colt Lannan Series Super Spot. And I just read last night where he wrote in an article that he thought he was going to get the Colt bought for about seven fifty to thousand dollars, maybe tops, and uh, he actually ended up buying him for seventeen fifty. And I think he was the high selling yearling. I know he was at the sale. He was the high selling yearling uh, that day. So uh, leopard, leopard, leopard. Yeah, <laughs> there's Tracy Keen. Yep, yeah, he was early day breeding leopards, Tracy. So yep, yeah. and uh, we're going to see some other stuff he bred too. But he did like colors and a lot of these were by Lannan series super spot his breeding still going today and helping those colors uh, of course that goes back to siri chief but another big purchase he made in 1967 that maybe didn't seem that big at the time i'm sure she didn't cost a lot of money but he purchased a small quarter horse mare and a lot of people that follow poas and follow my stuff is going to know who she was and her name was chip oleo and Chip O'Leo is very important to me and uh, my program when I was raising POAs and my dad. And uh, she's actually important to a lot of people. And some people probably don't even realize it, uh, how important she is to the program, their programs. Now, there's Lannan Series Super Spot after he got older. Uh, he, he was about 48 inches tall, so he didn't get very big. 
and uh, he crossed him on this mare I'm talking about, Chip O'Leo. He crossed her to a lot of other uh, POAs too. But here's a page. All these stallions in this page on this photo gallery here are related to Chip O'Leo. So and we're going to talk a little bit in depth about her and uh, what she did. I wrote an article about her in 1999, and I said that she's related to uh, well over 50 international champions. Again, that's when the show was called the International. Well, that's multiplied by 10x. I mean, I don't know how many champions she's related to now, but it could be 500. I mean, it could be a lot of them because you have her grandsons were... Hive Avatar was a grandson, born in 79. He's up in the upper right. And then his son, Avatar's Muchos, in this picture gallery. And then down on the bottom left is East Acres Chippetuff. That was a grandson. He's a three-quarter brother or half-brother, however you want to put it. Same mother as Tracy's mare, East Acres Miss Tuffet. She was a supreme champion. She was by Double Tough and out of uh, a Chip O'Leo daughter. And Chip Tuff was out of a Chip O'Leo daughter, the same one, and but by East Acres Tough to Beat. Of course, Chip O'Tough sired Kiddo Tough. So you have Avatar, Kiddo Tough. You have horses like Campbell Zippo, uh, the Silver Kid. So Campbell Zippo, you know, he's the sire to Zip and Gold. So everything related to Zip and Gold, anything related to Campbell's Dream Catcher, uh, a lot of stuff, you know, they're just on and on. There's so many, yep, yes, East Acres Miss Leo is the mother to the two I'm talking about. So she was one of her early POAs. So um, Driftwood's Dynamite is the leopard there. Now, one thing about Ray, critics could say, and we're not going to get into negative stuff or anything, but Ray did breed pretty large uh, back in the 60s and the 70s, especially the 70s. But he was using, well, you know, Super Spot was only 48 inches, but he also used some quarter or some Appaloosa stallions and some quarter mares, and he would get some POAs that would mature over the 54 inch limit, and Dynamite was one of them. Uh, but I, he must have been a heck of a horse. I never seen him uh, in person. There's not many published pictures of him. There's one right there. Uh, Ray did send me a couple. They weren't the best pictures in the world, but like I say, he was never promoted or show, shown, but he was one of the early sons of Chip O'Leo. And then uh, Chip O'Leo had uh, East Acres Miss Leo, that is the mother to Tracy Keene's mare, uh, Miss Tuffet, East Acres Miss Tuffet, that the uh, Sweets made a supreme champion out of. And then, of course, my family purchased East Acres Chip a Tuff from Max Nebergal. Now, growing up, it was kind of funny because we were in Minnesota and we were real close to Bud Campbell. He was about three hours away from us in Rochester, Minnesota. But Bud was a big influence on a lot of new people in Minnesota and stuff. He had a stallion named Driftwood Siri Tomahawk that my family ended up buying. But he wasn't bred by uh, Ray. He was actually bred by the Murfelds. But Ray had bought the mother. And But Bud Campbell, Max Nebergall, and Ray Peets were like the three amigos when I was a kid. When I got into POAs as an eight or nine year old, those three guys went to sales together. They went to sharpings out there to uh, the exotic animal sales. They just, they were together all the time. If you went to a spring sale in Rochester, uh, they would probably be there at Bud's house, especially Ray would be, Ray and Avis would be sitting on the couch. And I remember just sitting on the floor listening to all these stories. And uh, Ray kind of reminded me when I was a little kid of like Gary Cooper. You know, he was kind of the silent type, but when he would talk, you listened to him, and you kind of got the feeling that he could handle himself. And uh, when I wrote his uh, obituary for the POA magazine in 2005, he passed away on Futurity Day in uh, October in 2005. And uh, he was actually a bomber pilot in World War II, Ray was. And then he became the mayor of Spencer for several years, and he was on the city council. He owned a business, and he also ran the bulk oil plant in Spencer. But... He also raised uh, hundreds of POAs that meant a lot to many people. So we're going to back up a little bit and look at some of these early day stallions. So you have Driftwood Topaz. He was one of the pizza's early day stallions. A uh, little guy. He was uh, number 4226. So he was related to uh, a son of Polka Dot Prince. So very early. Polka Dot Prince was a famous stallion in Minnesota and then went out to Pombo and Sons in California. He was registered 39. So Ray had an own son of him. Uh, 
Here is Driftwood Siri Nugget. I know some people remember him. He was in Iowa for a while after Ray got rid of him. You see their ad here, half quarter horse. That was important then, the 12,302 12, registered POA of all time, and he's advertising that he's, he's half quarter horse. So. And there's Lannan Series Super Spot that did probably the most of any stallion for his program. He used him the most. He kept him for a long time. When he got older, he did sell him to a family in Iowa. Uh, but he was, you know, in his 20s probably by then, and he bought him as a yearling. But he was the exception of the rule for Ray. Ray didn't believe in falling in love with the stallion. Uh, he, even when Ray was up in his 60s and 70s, he would try young colts, and he might breed them and gild them before he even seen the colts, and he'd sell them. Some of them went on to be uh, good gildings too, and then he'd got them from other breeders and just tried them for a year. We'll be talking about some of those stallions too. Uh, here's the pictures again. I mean, that's pretty impressive when you have Kiddo Tough and Hive Avatar. Of course, when you cross those two, you ended up with the Silver Kid, who's the leading sire of national champions in our breed right now. So I hope more people join on right now. All you have is Tracy commenting, which is great. Tracy, comment as much as you want. I wish I could fly you out here to Enid and you could sit next to me and be the co-host like Ashley was uh, our first episode. So here's another example, kind of like Dynamite. I don't believe this horse was ever shown. I'd have to talk to Ruth Picoy or somebody like that, an older historian. Uh, but take a look at this POA. I mean, this was in the early 70s, number 15, almost 16,000. He was a half Arabian. He was a mini Joker, a Joker B-bred POA was his sire, and uh, an Arabian was the mother. I remember uh, Ruth Picoy. Uh, writing that he was an accident. So I don't know if the POA accidentally bred the Arabian, but out come this beautiful dark with a big blanket stallion, and Ray kept him for quite a while. He leased him to some Iowa breeders too. He never did become that famous, but he sure was a good-looking rascal. And he might have been tall, I'm not sure, but Ray would keep stallions like that that he never promoted. Some of them he never advertised, but guess what? He bred them, and sometimes he'd keep daughters like Dynamite. He had... Uh, a bunch of daughters by dynamite and uh, I know he kept some daughters of driftwood desert song here's another picture if you have Gary Hamilton come on your place and take a picture of a of one of your stallions that you never shown you know you liked him so and you see here ID 4452 so that means he did go over in height and he talks about Joker B breeding topside out of a full-blood Arabian mare then the mare was a registered Arabian at uh, least a by Max Nebergall in 77 and Vic Clark in 78, also being trained by the Clarks at this time. Uh, both well-known Iowa people, Vic Clark and the Nebergalls. Max just went in the Hall of Fame last year. So just a, a beautiful example of a POA that uh, a lot of people probably don't know, but he's good to look at. And here's one of his offspring that was in a sale. So this is a Wiggy Wom, was a son of him. Out of Miss... Wigwam's dandy do. He was selling both of them. This would have been probably 77 is when this was, I believe. Well, it says right there, 78. Yeah, that would have been at the 78 sale. So here's another stallion he tried for a while. You got to remember that when Double Tough came in the breed uh, in 74, when Max Nebergall first showed Double Tough in 75, and he won, and then he wiped him out for four years in a row, he won Grand Champion Stallion. He changed the breed while well, a lot of Iowa breeders were trying and other breeders decided, hey, we need to start getting some more Appaloosa breed breeding and quarter horse breeding into our programs. And some of them ended up buying well bred stallions and Ray was one of them. He started using some Appaloosa stallions in the late seventies and Joker's Raffle was one of them. He was a solid uh, own son of Joker B, as it shows here. 14.3. Now you gotta remember that was when the height was still 54. It wouldn't change for quite a while, probably about eight years after this picture was taken. So he was taking a chance, but he had some shorter mares, especially some daughters of Land and Siri Super Spot. And here's one of his foals. Uh, Joker's Raffle did have some show, foals that ended up showing, and uh, Driftwood's Joker's Elf was one of them. This was a 78 filly that he consigned to the sale. There you see a mare. I bet she was a few spot driftwood silver elf. They didn't talk about few spots as much then, but that's uh, that's one of his foals there. 
So here's a POA that I know some people know. I believe he was in Wisconsin for a while. I think he was showing all over Driftwood Series war paint. Uh, I know he was, I don't know how many points he ever accumulated, but he was one of those POAs I talked about that just kept going, a nice colored POA about 53 inches. And uh, he was a super spot son out of a Driftwoods Inca. That was, I don't have a picture of him tonight, but he was a black with a white blanket, one of his early stallions. Um, Inca, he, he was really kind of, he reminded me of Crystal's Dakota a little bit. He was, you know, 30, 40 years before that, but he was definitely black and then white. He didn't look like a lot of modeling or anything, but uh, an Appaloosa blanket. So here's some of the foals that he consigned over the years. Driftwood, San Juan, Buzz. Just look at those colors. I mean, he says red roan there, but, uh, you know, big old blankets, loud coloring. Here's another one, Driftwood's Black Magic. Okay, the reason I put this in here, there's no picture, but this is Driftwood's Fire Dancer, a 1968 mare. But look at the pedigree. In 68, her sire was Driftwood's Topaz, who was, uh, we seen a picture of him earlier, Polka Dot Prince son. But the grandma on the top side is Driftwood's Sunset, and the grandma on the bottom side is Driftwood's Bandit. So... And then Fire, Foxfire is the mother. But you have two Driftwood grandmas for a 68 foal. So you can tell he kept his fillies and he was doing it for a long time. So that's why I had this example here. You got three generations of Driftwoods already in 68. Here's Driftwood's Bay Nugget. I know some people remember him. He was a stallion for a while. And he was a Siri Nugget son. We've seen a picture of Siri Nugget. He kept him for quite a while as a sire. He didn't keep Bay Nugget, he sold him right away. He would have been a baby here when he sold at the national sale for $260. You gotta remember, you know, a new truck didn't cost 60,000 back then, so you didn't need to get 2,000 for your foals. But here is an advertisement for that horse right there. So this is Driftwood's Bay Nugget. I wanna thank people for putting pictures on Facebook this week. And uh, I got pictures up to just 10 minutes before I went on air. I wasn't able to include all of them, but I did put one uh, in the promo spot for this show. Yeah, I believe Washington State, Tracy. I know he was in out west, uh, the northwest, I believe. So, uh, because I know uh, Wallace was talking about him. So, uh, Sue Wallace, I believe, was mentioning him in, on Facebook. So, somebody can join in here. But so here's the stallion I talked about earlier. This was one of Ray's best friends and POAs. This was Bud Campbell, and this was Driftwood's Siri Tomahawk, which uh, Bud didn't get him from Ray, but he ended up getting him. And uh, Ray fold him out and named him Driftwood Siri Tomahawk. He purchased his mother, uh, GR Super Chiefs Wendy, from the Murfelds. And then he, he sold this guy young. He went out to Indiana for a while. And then, of course, Bud had him for a long time, raised a lot of Campbells. And this is going to come back full circle because Bud ended up having a Driftwood stay, and we're going to talk about later in the 90s, late 80s and early 90s. It's going to come full circle and bring a lot of people that are in POAs now saying, oh, okay, yeah, Ray, Ray Pizza stuff's in my, my pedigree. is real close. So we'll talk about him here pretty quick. So 1972, I know I've talked about this before, but uh, the Victor family, the Stones, and the Pizzas got together and had a production sale, basically. And uh, this is one of my prized possessions. I have a few of these, but the 1972 red carpet POA sale, and it's got a nice gold thing hanging off it there. I cut it off in the picture, but uh, this has a lot of POAs from Ray. They consigned them to the sale. I don't think the sale was that big a hit but hey it was something you know three breeders trying to put on a big production sale so now this is a filly that kind of changed POAs and she changed Ray's uh, breeding program for sure he ended up not using her in his breeding program but she garnished a lot of attention and one is one of his first really homebred uh, big champions he'd been in POAs quite a while when this filly hit the ground 15 years uh, about her more actually when she was born in 1975 and this is Driftwood's Misfire 
Now, Driftwood's misfire, as you can tell, was a gorgeous-looking filly. She was way ahead of her time. She won the International Futurity. Now, again, another little history thing. The International Futurity started in 1970, along with the, it was with the sale, just like it is now. And then the last year for it was in 81. And then in 82, the Select Sire Futurity took its place. So by then, Ray was in his 60s and are getting close to being in his 60s, and he was slowing down. But the International Futurity, uh, Ray ended up dominating, and this was his first winner. There's a picture of her there in the sales ring. She sold for $2,200, which is a lot of money in 1975. Of course, she topped the sale, was in the top 10 of the sale. And Harold Slegel uh, from uh, Hidden Valley Farms in Davenport, Iowa, bought her. I believe that's young Mark in the picture. That was their younger son. And again, this was at the national sale in 75. And uh, what she went on to do is she got pretty big. She won the Futurity and then she got over 54 inches. But uh, Harold bred her to Siri Silver Prince in 78. And in 79, Hive Avatar was born. And of course, Hive Avatar became one of the leading sires. He's still ranked in the top 10. For a stallion born in 79, you know, and hasn't been breeding for a long time now. It's been passed away for a decade, a decade probably or more. Uh, he's still ranked in the top 10. So, and he's the sire to the Silver Kid, who is number one leading sire with pushing almost 200 class wins as a sire. And uh, so Avatar really changed POAs. He had halter babies for uh, the Borjons and the Damons and, of course, the Slagles. And uh, then he had a lot of performance champions, but this was his mother, and she was so far ahead of her time, and she was the daughter of Chip O'Leo, and so she would have been a half-sister to uh, Dynamite. And that's a picture of them, and you can see it's kind of cool up there, Pete's and Slagle up in the upper right, and it's saying what, now that year is wrong, but 76, because it was 75. Uh, but it, uh, it was the high-selling filly, broke the record for the high selling filly so now her first baby was hive avatar in 79 but then driftwood's misfire also produced surefire which sometimes she's referred to as surefire angel she became a champion poa in the top 10 in the nation and won national classes international titles uh, she was a full sister to avatar and then in 1994 the behringers raised a colt by their little stallion, uh, and he was uh, truly loaded with options, was his name, and he won the international in Tennessee as a baby, and he was by their stallion, yours truly, that started their truly, all their truly POAs. So she was uh, 15 when that foal was born. But again, she was one of the foals uh, by Chip O'Leo. So there's that. We looked at that picture already. So here was the second Futurity. Actually, this was the third Futurity winner. This was the 78 Weanland Colt winner, Driftwood's Alibi. And he's a son of Dynamite. So Driftwood's Dynamite. So this would be a grandson of Chip O'Leo. And uh, he won the Futurity in 76 with Driftwood's Mariah. I do not have a picture of her. I believe she was a few spot. She was, I think she was white. I never seen her in person. Uh, but I did see a picture of her as a baby and as an older horse. She didn't change color. So, But this colt here, I don't know what he went on to do, but Ray used him in his advertising for years, uh, Alibi. He'd be his third Futurity winner. And back then they had a something star award, they call it, Red Hill. Somebody can correct me if they were around back then, but I believe it was Red Star or Red Hill Star, and it was basically the overall winner won it. And usually Ray's babies was considered that. They'd win that award too. So in 1981, Ray and Avis's daughter, Renee, uh, bred a mare, Crackle Bar D was her name, to their stallion, the Pizza Stallion, which was Driftwood's Dynamite, and had the last international Futurity Colt winner, which was Kino's Showdown. And this is him there. So he'd be a half-brother to Alibi. And he, like I say, he won in 81. So this is a Chip O'Leo uh, grandson here. That mare in the background, and I don't know if Tracy's ever seen a picture of her. She probably has, but that's East Acres Miss Leo. She was one of Chip O'Leo's daughters that was born solid. She was a solid bay. And uh, 
This is East Acres Chipotuff. He was born in 77. Uh, Max Nebergall kept him until he was six years old. That's when he sold him to our family. And uh, we ended up raising the kid, kiddo tough by him. And uh, we also had the tough dots, Sandy, Ruby, and Susie tough dots all became international champions. And uh, he crossed really well with Daughters of Dynamite. So that was lion breeding. We didn't even really know we were lion breeding at first, but we were breeding a Chippo Leo grandson to own Daughters of Dynamite that we had purchased. And uh, we got some great results out of that. But, yep, so that's the mother to your mare right there, Tracy. Sorry it isn't a better picture, but that's that's the little, that could be a Polaroid. I can't remember. I do my best with this new technology to try to fuzz out these pictures and get them looking the best they can. But I was always a big fan of Chippa Tough. He was one of my favorites. And, of course, he became the sire to Kiddo Tough, who is a lot of people's favorites. So here's a picture of uh, Alibi. Like I say, this would have been later. He's using them for advertising. Uh, there's a little better picture of him at Estes Park standing up. But uh, Joker's Raffle, Driftwood's Dynamite, Driftwood's Desert Song, and Land and Series Super Spot. So at that time, he was standing uh, four stallions that he was advertising. There's the Star Hill Award. That's what I was talking about in the bottom left there, uh, winner of the Star Hill Award. So. Here's a daughter of Chippa Tuff. This is Sandy Tuff Dots. She was actually bred by Max Nebergall, but she was eight days old when I first laid eyes on her, my dad and I. I would have been, let's see, 11? Yeah, 11 going on, or 10. I would have been 10, turned 11 that summer. So she was running in the pasture with her damn East Acres Arrow. East Acres Arrow ended up having four champions, the three Tuff Dots and then Sweet and Bounce was a champion she had also that the Kennedys ended up being one of their foundation mares. So, uh, of course, Sandy was one of my favorites too because Susie uh, Schultz's family uh, ended up getting her from us as a two-year-old and promoting her for us while we still owned her, and then they bought her, and she became Susie's uh, everything POA, you know, and she supremed her, and that's the POA she graduated on. So, And uh, thanks to Facebook, I've been able to stay friends with Susie over the years. And, uh, yep, Sandy became a supreme champion. She also was bred to Hive Avatar. So now you have, when they bred, when the Schultzes bred her to Hive Avatar, you had Chip O'Leo three times in that resulting foal. And that foal became Avatar's flying ace. They named him Snoopy. And uh, he looked like Snoopy. He was a little spotted POA, not very tall, but he became an international champion for the Merrills. Uh, and for, uh, you know, Marcy Merrill's kids rode him and uh, he won several classes so uh, now chip a tough this was one of his well-known show foals she won several national classes was high point like i said a supreme champion ruby tough dots uh, won most colorful and a bunch of high points and then Susie tough dots won two or three classes uh, but right after we bought chip a tough right before we bought him we kind of got lucky because marcy from minnesota marcy kruger she was marcy merrill at the time she won the international with Tough Tacos, the Chip a Tough son, in 83, the Wheeling Colt class. At the same show, the Gibsons had one that they had purchased from Max named Chip's Lady. A lot of people remember Chip's Lady, and she was a Chip a Tough daughter out of Driftwood's Cover Girl, a mare we ended up buying from Max, and Cover Girl was a dynamite daughter. So Chip's Lady was a lime bred Chip Oleo. She won the two year old Philly class in 83 at the national show, and then we just bought Chip a Tough like three weeks before the show, so we kind of got lucky there. And then Sandy Tough Dots was born that same year, and then three years later, Kiddo Tough would be born. So he kind of propelled Chip onto some fame too. So and Chip, uh, Chip's lady, you know, she had Chip and Z and all kinds of chips, uh, dudes Chip and Dip that went on to Texas to be a broodmare, and she won herself. So uh, the Chip O'Leo line and the Ray Pete's breeding went through that in uh, with the Gibsons in Wisconsin too so now this is a poor picture but I didn't have much time but this is kiddo bounce had to take a drink of water there but I just wanted to show you how far spread Ray's breeding's going you know kiddo bounce is having some horse colts born this year 
that uh, will end up being champions maybe 10 years from now, 20 years from now. They may win classes. And uh, he's related to uh, Ray's breeding through a kiddo, of course. This is a good picture of Doc's Rough and Tough. Again, I've always been a great, a big fan of Rough and Tough. The Damons is, did an excellent job with Rough and Tough. He's an old man now, but he uh, won as a yearling and a two-year-old and then became a champion sire. He's in the Hall of Fame. And, uh, you know, he was born in 89. Doc Nemers came up and looked at Kiddo Tough one real cold day when he was a yearling. Him and Ruth Ann uh, came and looked at him in Minnesota. And I think they spent the night in Minneapolis. And uh, anyway, he wrote us a letter and said he was going to breed some mares to him, and he did. We let him take him to uh, his place in uh, Dubuque there at the time, and he bred some mares, and one of the results was Doc's Rough and Tough. And even in black and white, you can tell how beautiful little stallion he is. He don't look like he's 50-some inches, you know, just 50 inches, but... Uh, So here's another POA that has the East Acres prefix, but he was actually bred by Ray Peets, and this is East Acres Gold Bar. I know if the Neblocks are watching, they'll remember him. Well, they owned him, did a lot of great things with him. He was actually bred to be in Appaloosa. Uh, he bred uh, the Chip O'Leo daughter, Driftwood's Gay Leah, that we're going to be talking about tonight, to an Appaloosa, and she was an Appaloosa. And uh, he got this little one, and he stayed small i mean this is i think him as a yearling back then the hardships were a little different now you have to be a two-year-old but tracy probably remembers in the early 80s uh, that's when they changed that before you could hardship them when they were a little younger than two uh, but yep he was an appaloosa bred by ray peets that uh, turned into a famous poa so my all-time favorite somebody wrote that i can't see who that is but hopefully somebody can see who that is and tracy has i've got girl power yep that goes of course, that goes back to, that's what I'm saying. There's so many, yeah, uh, Impulsive Superman. He goes back to uh, Chip O'Leo and the Ray Peets program. And a lot of the PAL ponies do, the RYs, LVOs. LVOs, uh, four on the floor, goes real close to uh, the Ray Peets program. So uh, we're going to talk about some of that. So, Oh, Tammy, good. So that was Tammy. Uh, thanks for joining tonight, Tammy. There's a... a the picture that was in the catalog when East Acres Gold Bar was consigned by that gentleman right there, Max Nebergall. Uh, but, of course, he was bred by Ray Peets. So this brings us into some modern history here. We were talking about Bud Campbell earlier, and uh, Bud ended up, one of his last stallions he had uh, was Driftwood's Mr. Music. Of course, he kept his son for a long time. That was Campbell Zippo. And so Mr. Music is also... If you can believe it, this horse here and this horse are half-brothers. They're both by or out of Driftwood's Gay Leah. So Driftwood's Gay Leah, I believe, is the mother to five international champions. And uh, they're not all Driftwoods, but most of them are. Uh, she ended up going when Ray got out of POAs. Uh, of course, Spencer to Haiti, South Dakota, isn't that far. And Gene Carr went down there and bought... A lot of his mares. Of course, Ruth Picoy was great friends with Ray and uh, Gene Carr, so she helped get that going. Uh, but he bought some of the, the mares, and he ended up buying Gay Leah as an older mare. So we had Chips Tiffany Snow. This is Charlene Link writing Sun, Sun Free Spot, St. Nick Snowstorm, and Chips Lady. Yep, so that was one from Wisconsin. And the Gibsons are tied in with... Uh, Ray several ways because they bought quite a few babies from him that were by Snowstorm and then him and Jackie ended up getting Snowstorm from Ray but they also had Chips Lady uh, that was through Ray's breeding program through Max Nevergall. So of course Driftwood's Mr. Music became the sire of Campbell's Zippo, Bud and Bertie Campbell's good few spot stallion. I don't have any pictures of him but he helped change POAs. He's he was a great sire of loud colored POAs. He really had, he was a few spot, but he threw loud colors. I remember his first 48 foals were all pretty loud. And he didn't have, I don't know if he ever produced a solid foal, because some few spots do, you know, at birth. We all know that. Uh, but here's one of the examples of his uh, great colts. And this is 
Uh, of course, Nicky with Campbell's Dreamcatcher. He was the grand champion stallion at the 2001 uh, show. So, and then his son was the grand champion stallion in 2002. So Nikki did a great job promoting her POAs, and she bought him as a baby at the international sale. Uh, this was out of Bud's uh, famous old black quarter horse mare. But Dreamy is still alive in PA, yep. and his full brother is in Oklahoma, just down the road for where I, from where I am now. He's got a little more solid color on him, but he's got a big blanket too. That's uh, Dream Maker. This is Dream Catcher, and of course, Dream Maker uh, was in, shown in POAs for a long time. But um, Campbell's Dream Catcher was the flashy zip and gold son you know he was or i mean the i blew it now but the campbell zippo son that got a lot of the headlines and stuff and he did a good job as a sire but uh the stallion that went out to utah zip and gold he was bred by the rogers they brought a mare up to bud and birdie and bred it to campbell zippo and that he became the sire of uh three international champions he was the first sire to sire all three the stallion mare and gilding and, of course, they were all our wives and all bred by the gardeners. So uh, there again, the blood of Ray and Chip O'Leo is still going on today. So here's St. Nick Snowstorm. This is one of the revolving door stallions I'm going to talk about. Ray produced some champions by him. And uh, there was several people like Marcy and uh, Jackie Guthrie, Larry Gibson. There was more people, too, that would make a trek to get yearlings and late weanlings from Ray, and a lot of them were sired by Snowstorm. This would have been the early 90s, late, uh, late 80s. So he didn't keep him very long because he doesn't keep stallions very long, but he, uh, he ended up having quite a few driftwoods that were champions by Snowstorm. Uh, Miss Crystal Snow did a great job for Jackie Guthrie, and uh, she was one of the Ray Pete's products that she bought from Ray and name Miss Crystal Snow. Now again, Miss Crystal Snow, who's her mother? Driftwood's Gay Leah. So she'd be a half-sister to several of these we talked about, Gold Bar and uh, Campbell Zippo's sire. So, you know, breeding breeding will show up in anything. I'm a firm believer in that. You know, if you uh, breeding will show up in an ant, so uh, especially bad breeding. So good breeding tells all the time. And uh, that's right, Tracy, uh, Snowstorm ended his life with Case Wink in Virginia. So, uh, yeah, but he made his mark on POAs, and especially when he bred Galia and uh, Miss Crystal Snow. Here's a couple of his foals, one bred by Jackie. And that's Jackie Guthrie on the left, and that's Marcy. Marcy Kruger, Marcy Lassiter, I believe is her name now. Sorry if I screwed up your last name, but... Uh, she bred for a lot of champions as Marcy Merrill. She grew up in POAs. We talked to her sister last week, Danielle, but this was at the Waterloo World Show in 93. That was a huge world show, almost like a national show. And uh, then were two snowstorm colts. I believe Blizzards Are Tough or something like that was, uh, I haven't said that name in 20 years, but that's uh, the one on the left, or right, I mean. And, of course, that's JBJ's Ms. Sable Snow. Uh, a well-known POA, won the Futurity. That's her on the, the left with Jackie, her breeder. Uh, but these are both snowstorm babies. So there's a colt. That's me showing him in 1986. This is double shot. The same year we had Kiddo Tough and Ruby Tough Dots. We had a colt that my dad really liked. He would have been a half-brother to Chippa Tough. Related. He was sired by East Acres uh, Tough to Beat. And out of a quarter mare, we went to Texas to buy. A guy that worked with my dad had a couple quarter mares. We brought one home, sold it to the markers, and then we kept Bonnie Jolene and raised this colt. And if you recognize the name Bonnie Jolene, that's the quarter horse mare, the mother to this colt. Well, we traded him as a late yearling. It was like four days before Christmas. We made a fast trip down to Spencer from Kimball, Minnesota, took a little two-horse trailer, and hauled double shot down there. We didn't really need him. He was a stallion prospect, but we had Kiddo Tough, so we kept Kiddo. And uh, Ray, this was one of the stallions. He bred five or six mares to him and then gelded him and sold him to a girl that had him for a long time. Larry uh, Myers told me he was a kind of an open show gilding in Iowa showing that did well. He'd heard of him. So anyway, I never heard of him again after Ray got rid of him, uh, but he was a good-looking uh, POA when he grew up. I did see one picture of him uh, because he became the sire of Driftwood's Megabucks that the Cooks 
bought in uh, Canada and made a pretty good name for him with a high, high five POAs up there. And uh, Ray actually, that was one of his last stallions, was Driftwood's Mega Box, and that was the son of Double Shot. And then uh, Driftwood's, I know there's several dances over the years. There's Flash Dance and stuff like that, but Driftwood's Fancy Dance was a mare that did pretty well across the Kiddo Tough. She was injured as a young horse. And uh, the Krugers had her. Jackie Guthrie had her. We ended up having her. I think uh, Gordon Kruger gave her to us, and I raised some babies out of her. But she was a really loud-colored filly, but she was hurt, so you couldn't tell, you know, really how well she was built. Uh, but then you have Driftwood's Bonnie Jolene became a supreme champion for the Lewis family. So Bonnie Lewis showed her and won in JPFC. And then, of course, Jeremy showed her jeremy poitra and did well on her she was a snow cap mare and uh, she was a daughter of him so i think he had four registered foals and three or four of them uh, became well known maybe five registered foals one of his fillies driftwood wiki up might have been the best poa he had and she ended up going to jeans gene cars and then ended up at paul filson's and when senator bred wiki up santee senator you had santee i believe bernadette was her name and then she became the mother i think to uh lvo's respect senorita and of course her full brother the the grand champion stay in palomino with the four white socks which would be lvo's four on the floor so we're going some deep history here but i hope you enjoy all this history so i know tracy does <laughs> so okay here's one of the Good Driftwoods POAs. This is uh, Driftwoods Siri Leota, I believe is how you say her name. And uh, she was in Iowa for a long time. Uh, this family had her. I'm drawing a blank on their name. I apologize. Tracy, help me out here. It starts with a G. But uh, she, uh, she was a great little POA, and they showed her for a long time. They might be watching tonight, hopefully. Oh, there! I was hoping I have a picture of her dad driving her at the 1987 International. I do believe I do have a picture of it. Hopefully, it's on here. It's in color. Uh, oh, I almost said their name. Granger or something like that. I believe they were big time POA people. It might say right there. Say the name. There it is, Paula. Yeah, Paula Schoner. And uh, she was a famous POA. She did well. She was a real pretty color, kind of a different color for POAs when she was born. Now you see that color, like the buckskin color and stuff. But back then, she was kind of unique in her color. So here's another Driftwoods POA that uh, made a name for herself. And I believe this is Tanya, Driftwoods Tanya. And I think that's Emily West with her. I may be wrong, but I think that's her. Uh, this is Heather, shown as a youngster, and this is Peppermint Bonbon. Now, uh, that'll bring us to some of the stallions that Ray had that wasn't uh, Driftwood stallions. Of course, he had Joker's Raffle that we've seen, but then he had a stallion named Bar Rockadot, an Appaloosa stallion, and he became the sire of Sugar Bar's Dottie, who could have been Driftwood's, you know, and Dottie Rockabar and some mares like that were daughters of his, and then this is Peppermint Bonbon. And, uh, of course, he had Easy to See Leo, and he also had Straw Terminator for a little while, not very long, but Straw Terminator, uh, actually, the Carlsons went down there to Spencer and got him and gilded him, and he became a supreme champion because he was a double L. Dickens son related to all those great Straw POAs. Uh, but Driftwoods, I think her name was Driftwoods Tango something. She was on the cover, Hank Frieder showing her. Uh, Jackie had her. Too. Jackie went and got her, I believe, Driftwood Tango Bars or something. But she was a she was a Straw Terminator daughter, one of the few that he produced. So here's another cool story. This is a Driftwoods. Uh, Lisa Reckon was talking about this story on uh, POA history. This POA was actually almost lost out of POA. So I believe I got the right one here. And I think this is uh, Velvet Sheba is her name. And... Uh, she looks like Gay Leah. I don't have pictures of Gay Leah, but I've seen her in person, and uh, she was kind of marked like this. She had the biggest forearms I've ever seen on a horse her size. The next closest would have been Black Swan S, but, of course, uh, Gay Leah was a full-blooded Appaloosa. So out of a, by an Appaloosa stallion and out of a court horse mother, Chippa Leo. So 
this was one that kind of lost her way and they found her way back to POAs and she was in California and did a lot of good things. Uh, here's, uh, I believe this is Billy Thunder, Driftwood's Billy Thunder. Here's another one, at least thanks to Lisa Reckon for sharing this with us. And this is, uh, let's see, Lisa's yelling her name right now and I should know it off the top of my head. Dixie, I believe. I believe this is Driftwood's Dixie. Yeah. This is the one that she said ran downhill, but she was a good, good POA. And she made her mark out in California. Now, these would be some of his later POAs, some of these. And some I haven't mentioned, like Cinnamon Snow that Marcy went and got. Uh, Tiny Bubbles became a pretty famous POA. She was uh, one of his later ones. And she went out to California, too, Tiny Bubbles. Now, this is a young Samantha Gallagher from Michigan. And this is Driftwood's Magic Monty, I believe is his name. And, uh, yep, Magic Monty. They won quite a few classes together. There's a nice trophy there. And they, uh, he was a fast uh, POA, too. And I can't remember how many they won, but they won quite a few. Of course, she ended up riding uh, the Crisco Kid, Samantha did. So this is Driftwood's Marnie. And I want to thank everybody for sending these pictures. Now, she would have been bred, I think, by Renee. Uh, Renee started using the Driftwoods. She went and got a Siri Sparkle was his name from the Pony Farm. She used him for a sire for quite a while. And like Driftwood's Silver Tabs that was in Michigan. And then Marnie and a few others like that was actually from the Driftwoods program. But it was from Renee, who is Ray and Avis's daughter. Now here's a POA. You may not recognize him in this picture, but I watched this horse show at a lot of Midwest POA shows. And this is Driftwood's Cool Nick. He would have been one of the later ones. He's still alive. He's 30 years old. I believe that's uh, Heather's grandbaby on him there. Uh, I think Katie's son. Hopefully I didn't get that mixed up. You guys can correct me if you're watching this. Uh, but that's Driftwood's Cool Nick. I know Megan Quigley showed him when he was in his prime she did pretty well on him so here's that picture again I just think it's cool you know Kevin Jewell went on to be a very famous he's one of those people you go in you can go to Georgia where he's at now or uh, you know Maryland or California and mention Kevin Jewell in horse circles and people's heard of him he's just had a great career in horses and he started in POAs uh, of course I got my magazine collection from his dad I've never, I don't think I've ever met Chris or Kevin, but I've talked to him over Facebook, both of them. But uh, that's a young Ray Peets there holding this. This is another velvet. I believe that's black velvet. Velvet was used in quite a few of the Driftwood's names. It wasn't really a bloodline. He just must have liked that name. Uh, but, you know, this is just a cool early day shot. So uh, let's see here. Who's some of the ones I didn't mention? I think I mentioned most of them. I don't know if I mentioned Aztecs. That was... Uh, a prefix he used for a while, uh, Aztecs. He quit using Driftwoods in the late 70s, and he, he named for a few years Aztecs, this and that. And then, like I say, he dropped the prefix altogether for a while, and that's when Sugar Bar's Dottie was born in 82, uh, Bar Rockadot Daughter. She became a well-known POA champion. Big Leopard Mare, Michelle Badger from uh, uh, Wisconsin showed her. And uh, let's see. I mentioned Driftwoods, Tawny, Cool Nick, Peppermint Bonbon. Uh, like I say, the Stallions, you know, St. Nick Snowstorm did a good job for him. I believe he had Mighty King Arthur for a while. He was a Klein Stallion out in Colorado. Mega Bucks, he had Inca, Topaz, Siri Nugget, uh, Driftwoods, Desert Song, he used for a while. Dynamite, he had for quite a while. And uh, he just used these stallions. Some of them he never showed. Like I said, and some of them were over height. Uh, there we go. There's a good picture. This is one of the better POAs he raised. And she's a little POA. Uh, but this is Siri Leota. Uh, that's how I pronounce it anyway. Lolita. Siri Lolita is how you should pronounce it. So, And this is... Uh, at the 87 International, she was quite a POA. She was on the cover of the 
70s magazine as we showed earlier and there she is a nice colored shot and uh, doing cart in a late 80s show so she was a short mare she wasn't very tall beautiful headed mare and like i say a pretty color for that color didn't start uh, really catching on in poas until the 90s and even now people are breeding for colors like that more that we know more about color genetics so so like I say, I could go on and on, like Tracy said earlier, or she said last week, Chippewa Leo could have her own uh, episode, and she sure could. I could talk two hours uh, just about Chippewa Leo herself, even though she was a quarter horse, and the impact she had. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk about Driftwoods on episode nine and get it in pretty early is because when I wrote the book, Spots Included, uh, Ray ended up not really being included in that book very well, even though he was a good friend of mine and stuff, but that had nothing to do with it. It was just he didn't keep a stallion long enough to have a stallion in a chapter. It was based on the Legends books, like from Western Horsemen, and uh, there was 26 stallions in that book, and Ray didn't keep one long enough. You know, Landon Series Super Spot did a good job, but he ended up being covered in Siri Chief's chapter. So, and then Chip O'Leo was a quarter horse mare. If I wrote a book about mares, just like I did with Double L's Dickens, I put him in the book, I would put Chip O'Leo in a POA broodmare book, definitely, even though she was a quarter horse because of the impact she had. And like I say, the horses she's still related to in the breeding programs that she uh, made a positive impact on and still is today. So, well, I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this episode of my POA podcast, uh, Black Hand and Beyond. This was episode nine. And uh, we didn't have any major sponsors tonight, but remember those regional shows in Kansas and uh, the world, West World, and uh, Rocky Mountain Regional in Colorado. And I want to thank everyone for watching. Uh, I did have some guests lined up, but uh, sometimes it just doesn't work out schedule wise or if somebody's under the weather. So maybe next week we can have some guests. Tracy, you may have to come on live on the phone next week because uh, I almost should take a week off to prepare for this, but one of my favorite topics in POA is, is East Acres Double Tough. I'm a little prejudiced on that. Uh, one of my good friends in POAs was in his Doc Nemers. Doc had, and then we were very, very close to Max Nebergall. Years after he got out of POAs, he... Uh, he used us in the hauling business. We hauled a lot of minis for Ray Peets, or not Ray Peets, uh, Max Nebergall. So, and again, Max, Bud Campbell, and Ray were very close friends, and uh, they used to argue about politics and stuff. It was hilarious to watch, but I grew up around that, watching those three guys, but they were all great horsemen and all did great things for POA. So uh, next week, we're going to be talking about uh, East Acres Double Tough. The week after that, Jan Rogers, if you're listening, get the pictures warmed up because we'll be talking on episode 11 about gold prints. So I have my work cut out for me. Uh, Double Tough next week and gold prints the week after that. Two of the horses that really shaped POA even into what it is today. They brought it forward from the 54-inch pony to the 14-hand POA that we have today. You know, even the Pony of the Americas started, the name even was starting to get dropped and you heard POA more than you heard Pony of the Americas. And that started with the hard-shipped uh, East Acres Double Tough that had an Appaloosa dad and an unregistered mother and then the registered gold prints uh, from Money Creek Ranch. So that's going to be the next two episodes. Then we're going to get into some breeding programs. Uh, we're going to talk about, well, the straw ponies and the KSs. Uh, the Salties, the Santees, we're going to talk about my family, the Rorks in Minnesota, uh, Kiddo Tough, and some of the POAs that we contributed. And then I, I got a whole bunch of episodes planned. We have a lot of families and a lot of topics to talk about. Uh, I will take the week off in July. I'm going to go to the uh, Congress, and I guess I'm getting inducted into the Hall of Fame. My wife's got a little thing planned for that that night, so... Um, that's going to be Saturday night at Halter Day. After the show's over, they're going to have a little ceremony, I guess, in the arena or whatever. Due to COVID, we couldn't go to Indianapolis this year, so they've decided to do it in Tulsa, which is great for me since I live less than two hours away from Tulsa. So I'm going to have family members there and 
uh, people from outside of POAs that live here in Enid are going to make the trek over there. And I'm going to spend three or four days doing some research and watching the show, talking to some good friends. That's always enjoyable. And I'm going to be taking notes and getting ready for the next episode then. I believe it will be July 20th. That will be kind of a recap of the Congress, the 2021 Congress, and getting ready for the sale. We'll be talking to maybe some consigners or the or Jess or somebody that will come on here and talk about the national sale. We'll plug that a little bit. So, again, I want to thank everybody, especially Tracy Keen. You're my uh, POA uh, history sister, basically. So uh, <laughs> we got a bond there because we're two of the people. There's a lot of people that's kept POAs alive, but history-wise, I know we, uh, we're we really uh, dedicated to it. So thanks for all your comments and everybody else that's watched and enjoyed this. Uh, please tune in next week for uh, Black Hand and Beyond, my POA podcast. This is Kent Rourke. Have a good night, everyone.